Could everyone please take your seats again? I'd like to welcome all of you back. And we have a very exciting part of our program now. Um, I'm going to be inviting Marion Broom up on stage. I'm going to be inviting Marion Broom up on stage to present the Award for Excellence in Nursing Outlook. Dr. Broom is Editor-in-Chief of Nursing Outlook, the official journey of, journal of the Academy and the Council for the Advancement of Nursing Science. Marian? Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to um, announce our four awards this year for excellence in writing. And before I do that, I want to thank the committee, um, who are members of the editorial board, who um, deliberate all summer, um, looking at these articles that were published from June 19, 2011 until July, uh, June 2012. And the criteria is, um, if anybody's interested, the criteria is pretty well spelled out in terms of downloads and citations and things like that. Our relevance to policy is another important criteria. So Barbara Smith is the chair, Debbie Gross, Frank Schaefer, Kathy Knaffel, and Bonnie Jennings. I just want to thank them for all their work. Our first award is, um, and I'm not sure, I, I've met two of the authors, I know they're here, so if I haven't said hi to you and you are here, please come up. The first um, award is for Excellence in Education, and the paper is Mixed Messages, Hospital Practices that Serve as Disincentives for Associate Degree Prepared Nurses to Return to School. And the author is Leanna Orsolini Hain. There you are. I get to know these authors really well. Um, <laughs> the second award is for the Excellence in Policy, State Mandatory Overtime Regulations, and Newly Licensed Nurses Mandatory and Voluntary Overtime and Total Work Hours. The authors, and we have all three here with us today, Sanghee Bay, Carol Brewer, and Chris Kovna. Our third award is for Excellence in Practice, Interdisciplinary Collaboration in Geriatrics, Advancing Health for Older Adults. That's Heather Young and co-authors Siegel, McCormick, Fulmer, Harachan, and Dorr. And our last award for excellence in research <clears throat> goes to empowering staff nurses to use research to change practice for safe patient handling. We have the first author here, Candace Krill, today, and co-authors Staffolino and Raven. Thank you very much. I asked Marion to stop 
a moment from leaving the stage and just wanted to take a moment to thank you. With every issue, the journal just gets better and better. And I'd like everybody, please join me in giving Marion a round of applause for her excellent work. This afternoon, we have the privilege of hosting a panel of fellows who are doing groundbreaking work with the Institute of Medicine in various roles. To introduce and moderate the panel is Julie Fairman. Dr. Fairman is an Academy Board member and is the Nightingale Professor of Nursing and Director of the Barbara Bates Center for the Study of the History of Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania. Julie? All right, thank you, Joanne, for that introduction, and I'm pleased to be able to moderate this panel and to introduce you to our four esteemed panelists. Now, the Institute of Medicine has a long history of interest in nursing and its contribution to patient care. The Future of Nursing report was just one but very important example. What is perhaps less known to our profession at large is the critical work of nurses most of whom are Academy Fellows at the IOM as members of roundtables, chairs of committees, work groups, and task forces that shape health care and health policy in many ways. I'd like those of you in the audience who are IOM Fellows to stand. Members, members, sorry. Thank you. And I believe we have um, a number of people from the IOM who are also here, if they could please stand. I know you're out there. <laughs> Thank you for coming. We are really honored to have these four esteemed panelists, all who are highly experienced in the world of the Institute of Medicine, to walk us through how the work and how things really get done, and the impact they have had. So it's now my pleasure to introduce these fellows. Let me first say, though, that the way this panel will work is that each will have 10 minutes, and believe me, this is probably the hardest job at this conference. Um, each of them will have 10 minutes to talk and to present their material to you, and then we will have some time for questions. So I will introduce them all separately in order which they will appear. Okay, you can move that through a little bit more. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Tony Viobel is chair of the round table on the promotion of health equity and elimination of health disparities. She also serves on the IOM Board of Population Health and Public Health Practice. She is the Nola J. Pender Collegiate Chair and Associate Dean for Research and Global Affairs at the University of Michigan School of Nursing. Her research on the development and testing of interventions to reduce sexual risk behaviors among Mexican and Latino youth has resulted in a program nationally disseminated by the CDC as part of their Diffusion of Evidence-Based Interventions Program. She has served as a charter member of the HSS, HHS Advisory Council on Minority Health and Health Disparities. She has been active in leadership roles in ethnic minority nursing associations and currently, and not currently, she is the past president of the National Coalition of Ethnic Minority Nursing Associations. Dr. Villarreal has received numerous awards and honors, including membership in the IOM. Our next speaker will be Dr. Afaf Malis, who chairs the IOM Global Forum on Innovation in Health Professional Education. She is the Margaret Bond Simon Dean of Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. And I'm really honored to meet her for the first time. <laughs> 
She is the professor of nursing and sociology and director of the school's WHO Collaborating Center for Nursing and Midwifery Leadership. She is a fellow of the Royal College of Nursing and a member of the Institute of Medicine. Her publications are literally too numerous to mention, and she also serves on multiple key boards of influence. Dr. Melise has consulted and spoken in more than 25 different countries on the many issues of which she is very interested in, particularly the health of women and girls across the globe. She earned her PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles. Her research focuses on global health, immigrant and international health, women's health, and on the theoretical development of the nursing discipline. Our third speaker is Dr. Bobby Berkowitz, who is a member of the IOM panel, which identified the knowledge gaps concerning LGBT health issues. She is also, I believe, ser serving on the credentialing panel at the moment. She is currently the Dean and Mary O'Neill Mundinger Professor of Nursing at Columbia University School of Nursing and Senior Vice President of the Columbia University Medical Center. She has been designated a Professor Emeriti at the University of Washington. Dr. Berkowitz directed the NIH NINR funded Center for the Advancement of Health Disparities Research and the National Program Office for the RWJ funded Turning Point Initiative. Dr. Berkowitz earned a PhD in nursing science from Case Western Reserve University. And she is modeling one of the recommendations of the Future of Nursing Report by serving on many boards and is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine. Our last speaker will be Marla Salmon, um, who has served since on, from 2012 to 2013 as the ANA, ANF, AAN Distinguished Nurse Scholar in Residence at the IOM, focusing on women's empowerment and strengthening health systems in lower income countries. She too is a member of the IOM. Dr. Salmon is Professor of Nursing and Global Public Health at the University of Washington and Senior Visiting Fellow at the Evans School of Public Affairs. Her career has focused on nursing and public health in national and global contexts. Dr. Salmon has held leadership positions in government and non-governmental organizations, including the Director of the Division of Nursing, the U.S. Public Health Service and Human Services. She too has held many positions of influence on boards and advisory groups for organizations such as the World Health Organization. She has published widely and has consulted with governments as well as regional and global organizations. Please welcome these distinguished panelists and experts at the Institute of Medicine. Thank you. So good afternoon. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and really proud to be presenting with my colleagues. I think the work that you're going to hear today really just is the tip of the iceberg in terms of the contributions nurses have made within the IOM, not just in our work here, but in many others that have served both in membership committees and as part of study panels. I'm going to be talking this afternoon about my role and, importantly, the roundtable on the promotion of health equity and the elimination of health disparities. I'm going to present a background of the, um, of the roundtable itself, but a background in terms of how the roundtables function within the IOM, and then talk specifically about the goals and mission of our roundtable and um, share with you some of the activities and the impact it has, as well as some future directions. So IOM roundtables are a little bit different than I think what people associate with, with the IOM in terms of their commission studies. So the purpose of the IOM roundtables is really to foster dialogue across sectors and institutions to identify and eliminate issues. So unlike uh, studies that are uh, commissioned, we're not limited to a research question or a statement of task. We really are very fluid so that we can respond to emerging issues. Um, as a roundtable, we're not providing recommendations because the selection of the roundtable members is different. The selection for studies, we, there's a whole bias and conflict thing that you have to re reveal, and that's not part of the roundtable process. As such, um, any product that comes out, while it is reviewed by the IOM, 
does, is not, um, does not go through the same rigorous process as a particular study. So we're not able to provide recommendations, but the fluidity of the process really does allow for more rapid convening and also dissemination of these important discussions. And I'll share with you how it is that we've done that. So the roundtable on the promotion of health equity and the elimination of health disparities is part of the IOM board on, on population health and public health practice. Um, the roundtable was established in around 2007 as a direct result of the um, study that was commissioned on equal treatment. So again, it was a way of keeping the dialogue front and center on the issue of health disparities. In 2009, um, after much discussion and deliberation uh, with roundtable members in terms of trying to look at, next, at directions and in keeping current with how the world thinks about disparities, the name was changed and the uh, purpose changed to focus not just on the elimination of health disparities, but also on the promotion of health equity. The thinking was that it was a way of elevating everyone and not just addressing a particular problem, being more forward thinking than, again, trying to address past issues. So our forum looks to convene leaders from, various, from a variety of communities to meet and discuss emerging issues related to health equity and also health disparities. Our goals and mission simply are to keep the spotlight on disparities and health equity issues. So we're focused on the visibility specifically of racial and ethnic disparities in health and health care as a national problem. We really are looking at not, again, identifying the issues, but trying to identify those programs and strategies that are available to reduce disparities and to promote the emergence of new leadership in the health equity movement, especially for cutting edge programs and ideas. The framework that we use in terms of determining topics is um, we use a social justice and a so social equity framework. So we are cognizant that there are many determinants of health, the social determinants of health, environmental determinants of health, and some one of our colleagues on, on the roundtables have labeled the cultural determinants of health, looking at special populations who are confronted with disparities, such as limited English proficient populations and Native American populations. The membership of the roundtable is, is diverse, and there's various ways that you can become a member of the roundtable, and certainly paying for membership is one way to do that. Um, but we have representatives from academia, from many, of, uh, from many foundations that look at health equity as a central mission, such as the Aetna Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, the Connecticut Health Foundation. We have many federal ages, agencies and their counterparts that deal with minority health as part of the round table, and they are very active members. We have members of industry, pharmaceuticals, and some professional organizations that are with us as well. Um, I serve as the chair of the uh, round table, and I am the liaison to the, the public health board. My co-chair is Mildred Thompson, who is a senior policy fellow uh, at PolicyLink in Oakland, California, who really does deal with working with communities to address policy-related issues. Interestingly enough, she is, she is a nurse also. Uh, so again, you can see the variety of, um, of persons that we have that represent geographic, professional, and again, a variety of different interests. So the process that we go through in identifying topic areas and workshops comes from roundtable engagement. Uh, we, come, we do come to the table with many biases, with many uh, championing many causes, and we champion to try and figure out how is it that we can work to advance those using this as a forum. We also look for collaborative opportunities within the IOM with different roundtables as well as different opportunities from our foundation partners and others. We've also had roundtables that have been con commissioned around particular areas of, of topic. Unlike other roundtables in the IOM, we, um, we like to go on the road. Um, so we've been to Detroit, we've been to Seattle, and we've been to Connecticut. And we do these for, for a couple reasons. Number one, I think bringing the IOM to communities really does allow for access to people who can't and don't travel to Washington, D.C. to be part of those policy dialogues. And secondly, it really does spotlight local communities and um, area issues and promising practices that are going on in those communities. So as an example, we were in Connecticut last spring talking about um, address, trying to address and anticipate issues faced by racial ethnic communities and other underserved populations is, as the rollout of the ACA was eminent. 
We went to Connecticut, which is one of, probably one of the first states to look at establishing some of the marketplace. So we really had a chance to hear about what were some of the issues that they were confronting. Uh, we had the governor at our round table, and um, one of the congressional representatives were there as, me as well as members of their city council. And again, our being there not only highlighted the, the great work that they were doing there, but also brought some prominence to the work that they were doing in Connecticut. And as I said, as importantly, in th throughout our round tables, we really do focus on engaging communities, um, participation and engagement, both as part of the, ta of the round table discussion, as presenters, as discussants, but all of our forums are open up to the, are open up to the public. So here's an example of um, the products that are resulting from our round table. So we always come up with workshop, uh, workshop summaries that are available to the public, free, um, downloaded. And again, this gives you an idea of some of the topics that we have been engaged in. So looking at challenges and successes in reducing health disparities, looking at policy initiatives both at the state and local area in terms of how to address disparities, and a special focus on children's health. Another way that we have looked to disseminate some of the discussions on our roundtable has been through the IOM perspectives. So again, these are papers that were, um, were developed as part of roundtable discussions that we wanted to have more dialogue, or we said this is an important message that needs to go out. So here are two that were developed recently, one on um, patient-centered medical home and some real issues that um, both the promise and some of the challenges related to that. And then again, the one that we did with, in combination with another roundtable on health literacy, we had similar roundtables looking at, again, rollout of the Affordable Care Act, and we came out with a perspective paper. And these have been foundational to, again, as press releases, and again, furthering the dialogue and bringing attention to these particular issues. So what impact has the roundtable ha has? Um, we measure and we look at our impact in three areas. How is it that we affect change? How can we inspire action? And how do we inform the field? I think affecting change when we think about impact is probably the hardest one to get your arms around. At around, but one concrete example as a result of one t round table that we had on workforce was a conversation between uh, Walgreens and uh, the Office of Minority Health. And as a result of the conversations that we had around the table, they were able to free up 10 million on vouchers for free flu shots, and again, in partnership with Walgreens. In terms, great work. In terms of inspiring actions, our summaries have been used by our foundation partners as decision making for, uh, for grants or as um, outlines for delivering, making priorities for grant foundations. And again, we've certainly received a lot of information or feedback from our academic partner, partners in terms of how it is they're being used in their academic settings. And importantly, informing the field. So as a result of the round tables, we've been invited to do numerous spin-off presentations um, at professional organizations and again other related areas. The future roundtables that we have on our agenda, uh, one is slated for December 4th and 5th and we're calling it Catalyzing a Movement to Improve the Nation's Health. And we're partnering with the, um, with the roundtable on public health practice, population and public health practice, where we're really trying to look back and um, see what lessons we can learn from the 60s. The 60s in terms of the social movement about inspiring change in civil rights and in women's rights and in many areas. And how can we use those lessons learned to advance, the, uh, advance um, I'm, I thought the phone was for me, so I'm sorry. <laughs> But how is it? How is, how is it that we can, how is it that we can advance uh, health equity using this particular framework? Um, later on in the in the year, we're slated to go probably to New Mexico to a uh, second phase of a roundtable that we started with. Um, with a focus on Native American population. And again, as an interest from foundation, they asked us to focus on adolescents, specifically Native Americans, but I think we're gonna broaden that a little bit. Other uh, things on our agenda that people have approached us to that we just have to figure out time and when and where is taking a look at the displacement of vulnerable populations following a disaster. So really what does happen to people in communities like um, as a result of Katrina, as a result of, of Sandy, and how, how is health equity um, involved in those particular issues? 
We're also concerned one of our roundtable um, members is interested in looking at health equity issues in collecting and utilization of data, specifically as it relates to Asian uh, American and Pacific Islanders. And then one, of the, one interest of the practitioners is how is it that we address health equity at the point of care? The challenges of our roundtables, I think, are similar to discussions that we've been having here at the Academy, is how, is how do we disseminate and how can we maximize the impact of our roundtable meetings and discussions? So that's always on the, uh, an agenda item. And how is it that we can work to deliver these messages to different audiences, to our philanthropic partners, to, uh, for communities, and for academic and practice settings? So we have champions around the table who are looking for and waiting to take those messages back to their community. So in summary, I'll look forward to figuring out how uh, here at the Academy we can use this vehicle at the IOM to advance our issues, our strategies in advancing health equity. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to put this, uh, the IOM engagement within the context of what the IOM is about. Just a reminder that the Institute of Medicine provides independent, objective, evidence-based advice to political uh, policymakers, health professionals, and to private sector and, and the public. Uh, we, uh, the engagement that I'd like, actually, we are building uh, on each other here without realizing that we are building, so we go from disparities and equity to thinking about global health. So there are three ways by which uh, my engagement in uh, the Institute of Medicine has been. That's uh, through interest group, uh, through the Committee on U.S. Commitment to Global Health, which is a report I'll speak about, and then um, I'll speak about the forum, see this, the different ways by which we work. Uh, the, the IOM has 10 active interest groups. Those interest groups were designed with a variety of disciplines in them to work together to have serious, very enriching dialogues and discussion about a set of phenomena of interest to that particular um, interest, interest group. And sometimes the interest group also get together. But the conversation, the interest group does not produce uh, reports or recommendations, but what comes out of the interest group are areas of interest for which then the general program might be built on or future dialogues might also be built, built on. Um, the, the interest group that I'm in is focuses on global health, infectious diseases, and microbiology. We, uh, I'm on the planning committee. There are three of us on the planning committee of the program for that interest group. We started with the idea that we would have one, uh, one symposium, um, and then we decided that we needed to divide it in two. So we have been, we, we did last year on the challenges and opportunities of urbanization and how it affects health. And uh, this Sunday, we will have it on, uh, on actually sustainability, but it's the effect of the environment. And you can see these are issues that are dear to our heart as nurses and, and nurse, nurse scientists. So for the last year interest group, 2012 interest group, we focused on urbanization, and we were able to invite David Vlahoff to talk about urbanization in general globally, and then Dr. Lynn Summers, who is the director of Center of Global Women's Health, to make sure that this group, this interest group, really can focus also on some gender issues. Uh, she is the director of Global Women's Health uh, Center at Penn. Um, and it was great having Richard Horton, who is editor-in-chief uh, from Lancet, and he really does see all the, the uh, the different disciplines, and he is very interested, he has become really interested in what nursing ha has, uh, has to offer. Um, the interest group for, the, for uh, this year, which is, uh, I'm still on the planning committee of that, and by the way, so the planning committee is made up of myself and um, a physician, a uh, public health person, and a, and a veterinary medicine. So that interdisciplinarity in creating the agenda for, uh, for the symposium in itself informs what kind of programs might come in the future and what kind of program would be for the general, um, general meetings of the IOM. 
Um, this one is going to focus on the impact of, uh, of climate and, uh, and any changes in health. And one of the contributions I guess I, I make, made in this group is to just make sure that uh, climate and what's going on in terms of changes in it also should, we should have a discussion about its impact on gender specific determinants of health and immigration and violence, some of these things that are very dear to our heart here from uh, also for the, in the academy and the expert panels. That's, so that's the interest group. A second way by which I have been engaged with the Institute of Medicine is through the formation of actually a consensus report. And that consensus report was on, uh, on global health. Uh, the, uh, the committee charge for the consensus report was an examining current U.S. commitment to global health on identifying areas that need more attention and envisioning future investment and activities in health. And the Institute of Medicine uh, board decided that it would be really great if we, at the, at the cusp of changes in presidency, that when the new president was going to be elected in 2009, that he would have on his desk the mandate and policies related to global health. We, uh, we focused on um, that we really, we are not meeting the needs in the world. We, we have, this is a report that has evidence based. The staff puts together all, collects all the evidence. We study it as a committee to come up with a set of recommendation. And um, uh, we decided that health is uh, connected to a broader development agenda and to poverty. And that uh, what our advantage from the United States is the creation of knowledge and we really should take that advantage and uh, work with our colleagues internationally in continuing to advance knowledge and uh, use our previous successes as a leverage for that. Uh, realizing that we have not been really successful at that point in meeting the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. Our major findings from, from that report uh, ma mainly was that there was no coordination. There are just so many people interested in global health, so many institutes and so many different offices and that we also, there was an imbalance in the portfolio in relation to the disease burden. There was more focus on infection at the time, HIV AIDS, a lot less focus on lifestyle and chronic illnesses. And there was a little attention given our global health policy from the United States and our support of global health. Uh, little attention is given to health system, manpower, scientific capacity, and, uh, and also we found out we had strained relationship with World Health Organization, which was not really good for us, nor for World Health Organization. We came up with a set of recommendations uh, in a report that was released right about the time President Obama was, was elected and Institute of Medicine wanted to have that report on his desk as a, a first thing that he might look at. Our recommendations are that we need to generate more knowledge and we need to invest in the generation of knowledge globally. And therefore, we should increase our financial uh, commitment to global health, and, but engage in a respectful uh, reciprocity with uh, our colleague. But I think the one of the most important recommendations that we came up with is coordinate, coordinate, coordinate. We seem to be not coordinating at all the work that we are doing. So uh, we are doing in global health and the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. So what we, uh, uh, what, was there an impact of those recommendations? We believe there were three uh, specific impacts as we can see it. We think that the Obama administration embraced global health, we, they did embrace global health as a core feature of its national security, diplomacy, and development around the world. And we believe that the report had an impact on that. We also believe that the Department of State, USAID, identified global health as one of six development areas that they needed to focus on. And most importantly, the, uh, Nils Dulaire, Dr. Nels Dulaire was appointed as a director of the Office of Global Health Affairs of uh, health, and, uh, health and Human Services, and we believe that that was really a very coordinating effect based on, on that report. So that's, that's one of the things that the Institute of Medicine does. It puts all the evidence-based, put it together 
and uh, very well vetted in terms of the accuracy of that evidence and make the policy recommendations based on that that goes to the government. Uh, so the third way by which I am involved with, uh, uh, with um, uh, IOM is uh, through the recent um, co-chairing of this uh, forum. And uh, this came right after both the Lancet report and the Future of Nursing report came out. I was a co-author of the Lancet report, really committed to it, so I went to Dr. Patrick Kelly. But Dr. Patrick Kelly is the director of boards on global health, and I said, I think it would be really important that we combine those two reports and we form a commission that continues to move us forward, have a dialogue, but about the relationship between those two reports. One is about health professions in general, one is about the future of nursing, but it's, they are very much related. And I have to give credit to Dr. Kelly, who is here. Thank you for being here, Dr. Kelly, uh, for, because he moved forward and actually appoint a commission uh, to um, a forum, uh, a forum to work on getting the two reports together and continuing to work on them for at least three years, but we think it will continue. So it's a forum different than a, a round table. The global forum is called Forum on Innovations in Health uh, Professions and Education. And, um, and I want to acknowledge another that shows, you know, how the close working relationship between members of, an, or, of a forum or a commission with the staff of uh, the IOM that my colleague Patricia Cuff is right here. She is senior program uh, officer. And please stand up, uh, Patricia, to be acknowledged. And also, uh, Dr. Kelly, thank you so much. Okay, that's the commitment. That's a definite commitment to, uh, this, f to this forum and to the work that we do. So I'm co-chairing this forum, and it is my co-chair is Dr. Jordan Cohen, who is a former president and CEO of AACN, uh, uh, AACM, not AACN, Association of American Colleges of Medicine. It's been really interesting and wonderful and enriching, enriching to work together. But what is exciting about this forum, it has 61 appointed members who are academic experts in many different health professions areas, representing 17 disciplines and from eight countries. Um, but in addition to that, and that's, again, I uh, acknowledge both Patricia and, and, and Dr. Kelly to that, we have all those co-sponsors. Uh, we have 45 co-sponsors, six organizations are nursing organizations. So it is such a delight to look around the room and to see all those people working together, thinking about the future of health professions and thinking about how we can cooperate together and how we can produce the kind of professional that's going to make a difference in quality care, safe in quality care. We started from a set of principles that this is justice and equity uh, framework that, uh, that ties us all together in our work and in terms of thinking about the professions. Uh, we also um, said that the, really the focus for us is quality care of, of the communities and that we must include global learning in it. So you can see building up from previous reports uh, how we continue on that. Uh, the a forum works actually by creating workshops and bringing people together to work on specific issues. And uh, the workshops are co-chaired by other people. So that way, usually are as members of the forum, but also that these workshops bring people together who might not be part of the forum, nor members of the Institute of Medicine. So it's, uh, it's really, it's broad representation. We uh, identified three areas because the forum identified that, um, IPE, and how do we implement that, and what it's about, but it's innovations in those areas. And assessing, the last one we just had, is how to assess this interprofessionalism and how, how to actually establish it and assess it. Um, one of the things that uh, was important is the global aspect of this. So there was a, com a through competition, we were able to identify four different groups of collaboratives from four different countries who are working on the development of uh, interprofessionalism and leadership. And, um, and, and the beauty of having those collaboratives that every time we meet, they actually 
uh, present and build on the previous presentation. So we keep seeing the progress in, in how they are doing and, and what they are doing. So this is, um, uh, the, I have to acknowledge also the uh, Macy Foundation. He is a member of our organization, uh, of our forum, and he continues to work. There is spill, spill off from this because he uh, also, uh, Dr. George uh, Thibault, he appointed a commission to continue with that interprofessional theme and, and present um, uh, specific recommendations for interprofessionalism. You want me to finish? Um, okay, so <laughs> interdisciplinarity, that's what it's all about, and I will go, I will skip something here, and I'll go to the end. And I think really for us to achieve equitable healthcare globally, I think we really should forge that partnership between, uh, between AA and, and the IOM, and there are many opportunities for that, and I look forward to seeing that. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. So it is a real pleasure for me to be able to share with you um, some of the findings from this IOM study committee on LGBT health issues. Um, I learned a profound amount on the committee and I'll just, just have a, a very short time to share that with you. But before I start, I also want to thank the Academy's planning committee for including this particular study committee on this agenda. I know that many of you in the room are IOM members and many of you have served on Institute of Medicine study committees. So there's a lot of work that we as a collective have done um, with the IOM. Um, this particular report, however, um, for me was very special because I think its recommendations, um, its findings, um, its story really uh, should have a profound impact on our profession, both in terms of uh, our educational mission, um, our science practice, and probably most important, policy. So I hope I can spend just a few minutes giving you the flavor of that. I also um, want to thank the Academy because it came right uh, after this uh, study was report, uh, uh, reported out, is the new uh, expert panel on LGBTQ uh, health, and I think that uh, expert um, panel can, can lead some of the recommendations in this report. So um, just, uh, we were asked to talk a little bit about our own experience on the, on the work that we had done with the IOM. For, for me in particular, I have worked on a number of IOM committees. It's always a pleasure. You always learn way more than you bring. Um, and you meet uh, wonderful people, uh, distinguished people. It's always, it's always great. This committee, however, I think was, was my favorite for a couple of different reasons. One, I do believe I learned the most. Although I, I have um, a background in health equity and disparities and public health and population health, I learned more um, in this committee for, for a year than I have in any of the other study committees I've been on. I also had the most fun. This is, a, this is really a great group of people. I made a lot of friends, a lot of close colleagues uh, that I'm still in touch with. And it also has had an uh, impact on my role uh, in terms of advocacy for the people within uh, the many, many populations uh, that uh, has been termed LGBT. So uh, it was a great experience and uh, has helped me as in my role as, as a dean in terms of our educational and, and science mission. So let me just tell you a little bit about the committee. So as I think most of you know that uh, it's the sponsor of an IOM committee that sets the uh, charge. And in this particular case, this committee was sponsored by the National Institutes of Health and they ask our study committee to do at least many things, but, but these four. One is to outline a research agenda that, will, that would assist NIH in enhancing efforts in this particular area. And since we completed this work um, in, in 2010, that has begun. 
Also, to identify some of the research challenges and opportunities within this field, to look at the state of the science in terms of health status of LGBT populations, and then also to consider what research training would be particularly important to advance the knowledge about LGBT health. All committees come into their work with a certain premise or background in order to shape and frame the work. And in this particular case, um, I think first of all, the committee sense that recognition by the National Institutes of Health that there, there were major challenges uh, existing in building the science related to the challenges within LGBT health. That recognition alone was important to us as a committee. And the, uh, so the background was that this is a population and subpopulations with unique disparities. There has been limited research available on health status of, of these populations. There um, is a need, there was a need to identify very specifically what the research barriers and priorities are and should be, and then to uh, provide a platform for dialogue and action that could enhance research going forward. So our primary research perspectives, again, uh, most uh, IOM committees began with a thinking about how to uh, deliberate, how to frame, uh, how to guide our own work, and uh, this was no different. So from the um, literature review, we thought about approaches and frameworks. We selected these four as our primary way of thinking about our work. First of all, we chose a framework, the life course framework, which I know is familiar to most, most of you. The notion is that events of each stage of life, of an individual's life, influence all the subsequent stages and experience and is shaped by age, cohort, and historical context. And that fit very well for the work that we were doing. We used the minority stress model um, because sexual and gender minorities experience chronic stress as a result of stigmatization. Intersectionality, basically this means that individuals do have multiple identities that interact with each other over time. That includes race, ethnicity, income, gender, sexual orientation, sexu sexual nonconformity. So the notion that this is not a one-dimensional or two-dimensional challenge, this is a very multiple dimensional challenge. And then the social ecology perspective, again, I know that most of you are familiar with that framework. Many of you do research using that framework. But in this case, individuals are surrounded by spheres of influence, such as family, community, and society. And these all have profound effects on all of the subpopulations. So that was how we entered the work um, that we were doing. There were four primary um, findings, and um, I just want to. So, just a few highlights. There were many, many findings, and of course, I would highly recommend you read the report. <laughs> uh, so, but I'm just going to touch on a few. First of all, and this is probably not going to surprise many of you who do work in this field, but research has primarily been focused more on gay men and lesbians and less on bisexual and transgender individuals. Most of the research has been conducted on adults, uh, much less so on adolescents, and very few studies on LGBT elders. Research has not adequately examined subpopulations, such as racial and ethnic groups, and the barriers to research have included operational definitions barriers to participate for study participants and the small proportion uh, in the general population. These were uh, findings from our literature review and uh, as many of the committees do, holding um, workshops and expert and, and bringing people to the table who were experts in the field uh, and, uh, and within the communities. So our recommendations. Now, uh, as I'm sure those of you who have served on these committees know that it's not just a quick leap from primary findings to recommendations. There's a lot of work in between. But once we compiled all of our literature review, uh, a number of discussions among the committee members, 
we settled on um, four primary recommendations. The first one is obviously we need more research to build the evidence base. So within that, um, there are a number of issues related to where the, where the evidence is lacking. Some of it has to do with the way we think about a perspective for research. So the findings suggest that we need a much more cross-cutting perspective for research. This notion of one-dimensional, unidimensional is very important, particularly with the multiple subpopulations that are represented by this community. We need to increase demographic research across the life course and on LGBT subpopulations. The social influences on the lives of the populations, such as crime, victimization, housing, families, social and economic issues are really profound. And we need to know much more about how that interacts with health-related um, health status. Inequities in health care is also, we found a lot of literature that outlines the inequities in health care for these particular populations. We need more intervention research and much more research in transgender specific health needs. A second recommendation is that research that needs to build the database and methodology. We spend a lot of time thinking about, about methodology in particular uh, and how to build a database, particularly with a population that is fairly small. So some of the recommendations were to collect data on sexual orientation and gender identity in federally funded surveys. As you know, you're familiar with a lot of these surveys, but if you use some of the federal surveys to look for particular information about this, these populations, a lot of the surveys don't, don't have the data. We also recommended that data is collected on sexual orientation and gender identity in electronic health records. There is a very good paper um, that was published by a group called the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. They did a, a extensive search in the literature to think about uh, how transgendered uh, people were represented in electronic health records, uh, which was probably, you're not surprised, um, most of the identity is not disclosed in electronic health records, and they went on to talk a lot about how electronic health records could approach, people inputting data could approach this particular population. And then a third one was to support the development and standardization of sexual orientation and gender identity measures. A third recommendation and fourth, to develop a comprehensive research training approach to strengthen LGBT health research in NIH, and that is beginning and that NIH should encourage grant applicants to address explicitly the inclusion or exclusion of sexual and gender minorities in samples. We do that for women and children and mi minorities, but we don't yet do it for these particular populations. Now, just a, I'm going to close with just a thought about engaging nursing in education and research. So um, for nursing education, um, there is a pretty limited attention, although not, uh, not, not, there's no literature on this, but pretty limited research uh, in the nursing literature on strategies for including lifelong learning about LGBT issues in nursing education. And this is reinforced uh, by findings. You can read this particular, these particular um, journal articles uh, that lay this out very well. Second, um, the LGBTQ expert panel is working on a white paper on nursing curricula, which I believe will serve as a resource and exemplar. And the reason that the expert panel is taking that on is because um, there is very limited knowledge and information in most nursing education today about um, the kinds of findings that we found in our report. In nursing research, just want to shout out, there is a new journal um, that is called LGBT Health. It uh, it's has one issue out and more to come. It's going to be a wonderful place for nurses to publish their research. Um, the expert panel is also having a policy dialogue tomorrow that I hope many of you will be able to attend to address specifically LGBTQ nursing research and strategies to reduce barriers um, to health research um, in nursing. So I just want to end with um, something I know you know.
but I think it helps me to always keep this in front of my mind, and that is, how do people get ideas about what they want to research and what they want to write about? How do we, how do we come by those particular ideas? Well, one is through our exposure, our exposure to challenges and issues within populations that we might be interested in. So we're exposed through our educational process, through discussions with colleagues, to going to meetings. We're exposed to the challenges. We get interested in those challenges, either science or education or practice challenges. And we have a community around us that supports, does not discourage our interest in those areas. And then we generate ideas and we find other people who share those ideas and want to work with us. That's how most of us began our research and education or practice careers. This has been an area that has been hard for educators and scientists and practitioners because we have not had the exposure to generate the interest, to generate the ideas. And I, it's hopeful that this report and the Academy's support of this kind of work will help us going forward. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. It's, uh, I can't actually see you, but it's great to see you out there. And if anybody has uh, any suntan lotion or anything, I think it would help. It's very bright up here, but I know you're out there. So my role today uh, is to talk about the scholar experience. And in many ways, it rounds up all that we've talked about here. And it's such a privilege and pleasure to be with these esteemed colleagues who have all made an impact on IOM. In some ways, what I will be doing is a 40,000-foot uh, review of the landscape of IOM through the, through the lens of a scholar, uh, of which I have been and some others here as well, and talk specifically about the engagement in the work of the IOM, the project that each of us is, is really uh, very much embedded in in terms of this process, uh, implications, and next steps, and hopefully more than anything else, sharing the gift of the opportunity of becoming what is now the longest title and record, which is the Institute of Med Medicine, American Academy of Nursing, American Nurses Foundation, American Nurses Association, Distinguished Scholar in Residency. <laughs> so, so if you memorize it, you're on. It's important to know that the IOM is actually rooted in what we're all about. And I always go back to the inspiration that I feel in terms of the work that I've done, which is really health, science, policy, and the public good is so much a part of what nursing's heritage and legacy is. And so when, when you approach the Institute of Medicine, in, my, in many ways, you're approaching what is the best about nursing. And it's a very close, very close connection. So what did I do at the IOM? And this is the part about engaging with the IOM, and I'll go through it very rapidly. Again, 40,000 foot, 60 miles per hour. The Health Policy and Education Fellowship Office is where you begin as a scholar. And you're engaged immediately in an orientation with other fellows and scholars, including the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, Health Policy Fellows. Uh, Marie Micknick is the head of that office. She is a nurse who's been highly influential in policy and been on the Hill for many, many years and is now many years in IOM. So once you're engaged in that, you have a place and support. But threaded throughout that is your connection with boards. And boards are really the organizational structure for IOM. And I was very privileged to be connected with three boards, but most deeply with the Board on Global Health. And, and we've shouted out already Patrick, Kelly, and Patricia Cuff. But they have been mentors, collaborators, uh, just the best people you can work with. So the alignment with the work of a board is very important. Board on Health Care Services, I was also uh, engaged with in terms of its study uh, right now still going on on uh, the future of uh, graduate medical education financing and governance, very important committee. 
and with children, youth, and families looking at birth settings and midwifery, which is also very important. So it's been a very nice uh, context for my own learning, and I think, Bobby, you said it very well in terms of, of this being a place that inspires. Uh, the privilege of being on the Institute of Medicine Pre Presidential Search Committee is one that I've had, and most importantly, the peoples and, people and resources that you encounter and that I encountered were just fantastic. The scholarly project, which is part two of being there, it's not just being there, it's doing something there, is about advancing impact. And in many ways, it's in, in two areas. It's advancing your own impact, but it's also positioning what you do to help advance what we do in the academy and, and nursing writ large. So for anyone who wants to become a scholar, you can look to that scholarly project as being an opportunity for renewal, for taking your own thinking forward, your research, for recalibration, but exploration of that compelling idea, and I think, Bobby, you just said that, that idea that takes you into another dimension of your thought and of, hopefully, your understanding and ultimately your impact. And that exploration of a compelling idea is what is, I think, uniquely IOM. IOM is every single day engaged in exploration of compelling ideas on behalf of humankind. And the Scholarly Project is, is the next step foundation. So what was my compelling idea? And I have to say it's really a roll up of many compelling ideas from others. The compelling idea, huge, is explore the desirability and feasibility of innovative investment, meaning social investment, in nursing and midwifery training and practice as an enterprise to empower women and strengthen health systems, particularly in lower income countries. And I know each of you is cringing out there and saying that is not a question, that is many questions. You are absolutely right, and that's why it's an exploration. But I think it's important to figure out, first of all, where did this come from? And for me, it is that inspiration of being with others, particularly in the global health experience that I've had, the stories, the lives, and the work of nurses and midwives, not only in terms of what they do for women and others they serve, but what nursing and midwifery does for them. And then the natural experiment that we had in the U.S. in terms of social investment, huge social investment in the Cadet Nurse Corps, which was, yes, all about making sure we had enough nurses to deliver services, but fundamentally transformed the lives of nurses who became women who became nurses. So my inspiration goes back not only to intellectually to the experiment, but genetically to my mother who was a cadet nurse. So I have to say I was inspired from birth or maybe in utero, I'm not sure. Significance, critical part of the IOM, needs to matter. And in this case, the question relates to the importance of women's empowerment, the importance of strengthening health systems to the whole arena of development, whether it's community development or in the global sense, development of nations, regions, the world. Millennium Development Goals were mentioned earlier, which is the global agreement on what we need to do to enhance the well-being and health of humankind. Those goals have not been completely met at this point. They need to be advanced. So there's significance in this to help along the specific goals that I've identified at the bottom. And then, thinking uh, about nursing and midwifery's contributions, that we become explicit about what the contributions are that nursing and midwifery make for the empowerment of its membership, and empowerment in a sense that goes well beyond political power, education, uh, certainly economic opportunity, social mobility, all of those empowerment factors. And as I said, this is a lot of stuff, so I'm condensing it. The project exploration process, probably the most important work went into concept development. And out of that has rolled literature, both conventional as well as gray literature, but a lot of resource identification, model exploration, explication. So there's a lot of real time uh, exploration that's happening throughout this process. I call it the rolling learning process. And being an IOM, you have resources to both acquire information as well as knowledge, but you also have partners in the process of explicating that, understanding it, critiquing it, and then going forward, a platform for going forward. So this you don't have to read, but this was 
one of the initial group explorations of what is the concept map that we're looking at here, the subconcepts, the overlapping concepts, and for our purposes today, this is it. So what we're looking at and what this project has looked at is the intersection of women's empowerment and development, social finance, which is a burgeoning area and most of you would probably think of as things like microfinance, but it goes well beyond that, human capital bonds, other kinds of finance. The whole arena of public-private partnerships that's emerging, emerging, and Carolyn Clancy mentioned that in terms of strengthening of health systems, social enterprise, and then nursing and midwifery. And you can see a very small area of overlap. And the question is, should it be bigger and why? So highlights, findings, insights, implications, next steps, and I will go very quickly through those. Probably the most important finding of all is that social finance in nursing and midwifery is fundamentally an untapped opportunity. From a U.S. perspective, we may think about it as, think of all the nursing clinics that were great but couldn't get funded. From a global perspective, if you think about what's happening in terms of microfinance and other kinds of social finance for women's empowerment, nursing and midwifery are largely not on the screen. What you see mostly is movement of women into enterprise or in some cases into becoming community health workers. But nursing and midwifery and practices in nursing and midwifery are simply not in the screen except as fundamental foundations for uh, the development of private enterprise that nurses neither own nor operate. And those are a lot of the clinic systems that are being developed, the social franchises, et cetera. So it's an untapped opportunity. The desirability question, is it desirable to invest from the perspective of women, health, and society? All of the indications are yes, it's desirable, and there are big gains in all of those areas. And from the perspective of investors, investors who are looking for social gain, yes. And question mark in terms of having enough evidence to suggest that uh, there are adequate returns for people to invest in this. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Feasibility, is it feasibility? In terms of education and training, yes. We can invest in individual students, we can invest in program development, et cetera. There's a promise of payback in a variety of ways. From the standpoint of practice enterprise, and this is probably the most important piece for empowerment, enterprise that's owned and operated and or operated by nurses and midwives. There are promising inroads. We're seeing some models out there, but there are many, many questions that range from bankability to scalability to sustainability, but it's an area of growing opportunity. Implications, it's all about informing and positioning nursing and midwifery, becoming explicit about women's empowerment work, taking advantage of the social investment and public-private partnership factors and forces that are emerging. This is reshaping the whole landscape of global health. Investing in health systems change, leading it in directions, and Carolyn Clancy talked all about the opportunities that are emerging for us to invest differently, our time, our efforts as nurses and midwives. The confluence of sectors, we're seeing now development, whether it's community development or development from the perspective of nations and, and uh, nation states and health, the health sector starting to work together, and it is in that space that so much opportunity sits. And finally, it's a foundation for informing and positioning with respect to future exploration and innovation. Next steps, uh, I have the privilege of continuing my collaboration with the Board on Global Health, specifically Patrick Kelly and also Patricia Cuff. Um, we've been successful in getting, in getting Rockefeller Foundation support for a, an international conference next fall that will be focusing on the way forward in this work at the Bellagio Center. In the process of reporting and dissemination, taking the work forward in terms of both global and implications for the U.S., and this is one pitch I need to make to each of you, which is that Global work is very important because it can help inform us in ways that we haven't been informed before. So lots of things for the Academy. 
the American Nurses Association, the American Nurses Foundation, and the ICN going forward. Many thanks to, I'm not going to say all those again, also the Rockefeller Foundation, University of Washington School of Nursing, and the Evans School of Public Affairs, and a number of others, including my family, which is a really important part of this. And consider, please, the gift of becoming a scholar. It's good for all of us if you do, and you'll see Florence Nightingale in the middle of lots of people that she didn't used to know that fundamentally resulted in changing the world. Thank you. I'd like to thank our panelists. I think it was really a wonderful, wonderful panel. Don't you think so? <laughs> and I, I think we probably have time for a question or two. Is that okay? Um, come to the microphones. Yes. Yeah, can we have the house lights? I can't really see a thing. But please go ahead. I see someone standing there. Uh, uh, this goes quick. And uh, first, thank you. Uh, you, the, your four topics were about value positions, and I agree with all of them, so I'll acknowledge my bias at the outset. They also are something of fourth rail topics, or third rail topics, the topics that can become volatile in our society. And so um, we as nursing, supporting you in your work, would have to be somewhat bold in our positioning. So. Uh, yeah, I know, <laughs> for God's sake, be bold, yes, I know. So I, I would like you to each just briefly say, if you had a magic wand and you could get us to behave like you wish we'd behave boldly, what would we act like? What would we do? Thank you. Tony, you want to start? And Tony made me think of it, so she has to go first. Tell me again, what would, well, if one bold act as to how we would, how would we would, how would we act? Well, no, I, what hit me was you're, you're all pushing a margin, you're pushing an envelope somewhere. And it would be nice sitting at that table to say, I have nursing behind me in a very strong and powerful way. What would, if you had a magic wand and you could get us to be like that, uh, Afaf has an answer, you could tell her to go uh, first. I, no, I'll, 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 I'll start. I think, I think the, <laughs> I don't know if it's a behavior, but I think it's an acknowledgement that there's inequities and that just because you have an experience or you're not aware of it doesn't mean it's not real for somebody else. So I think if we could, you know, I really do think that the acknowledging it and understanding it, I think that really would change behavior. But I see too much of the fighting, where's the evidence for this, what, you know, why is that different, why do we need that, you know, isn't everybody the same? You know, I think we just need that acknowledgement. I, I'm hopeful that would change behavior. Let me just say first that uh, Dr. Julie Furman um, was, uh, didn't recognize that I'm her dean and therefore didn't give me enough time to speak. Uh, <laughs> you have more time than anybody. <laughs> um, I think if there is one thing all professions really should be become aware of is that sometimes we lose track of our social mission. We focus so much on all the things that would go in that we, um, best practices, uh, the, how we educate, uh, the curriculum, and we forget the reason why we are there. So if we, if I can, if I have a magic wand, uh, I think students come to us very oriented and very committed to social mission. And there's something in our professions and professional education that we lose track of that. So that's my magic wand. Let's think and let's focus our social mission and educate with the social mission and giving out. And look, and I'm building on Tony, um, come from an equity and a justice framework. And if we have that framework, I think we would be going to be able to achieve what we ought to be achieving in the world. Well, just, just adding to that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that occasionally, uh, probably more than we would like, um, we think of people, an individual, people or population, 
as the variant that needs to be remedied instead of the factors in the environment that are creating the variance. And I think sometimes our education, the focus on tasks and technology drive us there rather than thinking about the environment first. So if I could wave my wand, I think it would be to encourage us and our students to think about a broader vision of how individuals and people get to the space they're in where they're not healthy. Two things came to mind um, and have come to mind over and over again as I've worked in the area that I've been working on at IOM. And one of them is that in our professional aspirations, we are looking up and we have um, a perspective that I see most embodied in the, the phrase refrigerator nurse, which is that somehow we don't embrace nursing as an opportunity, both for people who become nurses, but for the people we work with as nurses. And by not doing that, I think we don't understand what the capacity and the power of nursing can truly be, and I think we don't connect with human need in fundamental ways. So I would love for us to think not only about interprofessional teams, but about caring and the team that cares and the people we care with every day that we don't often notice or talk about. And I would also think about us and what we do to extend our opportunities to those on those care teams that don't have those opportunities. We have time for one more question. I, you're the only one I see, Ruth. Me? Go ahead. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm a, uh, my name is Ruth Lubick, and uh, I'm not a person who has been in academia, um, but I had the opportunity to uh, really work through a not-for-profit not organization, which enabled me to do a lot of things that could not be done in academia or any other bureaucratic organization, I think. So I've been very fortunate that way. And I was a member of the first class of the IOM, and I wanted to congratulate the IOM on the ability given to individual members to make a difference. And uh, I talked a little bit with Julie about this before the, this session began, but, uh, I guess my, my, my drive, oh, well, let me ask, how many of you have seen Call the Midwife? <laughs> yeah. to, me, to me, Call the Midwife is old-fashioned public health nursing with a midwifery component. And, and I feel that I've been very fortunate to be able to be recognized at IOM. For example, the example that I wanted to give was um, my desire to have the IOM look at the ferment that there is in the public uh, amongst families about the setting for birth. And so I went to the executive officer of the IOM because I knew that a study had been done, a report had been uh, produced in 1982 called Research Issues in the Assessment of Birth Settings and uh, talked to them about it. I mentioned to Julie that the people I talked to couldn't remember the report, <laughs> had difficulty finding it, but they did go ahead and have another meeting um, and now are hoping to have a consensus meeting on uh, birth settings uh, uh, and, and uh, the report of the group meeting was, is available through the uh, Institute of Medicine and I encourage you to try to get it and read it. it is an update on research issues in the assessment of birth settings. Thank, Thank you. you, Ruth. Thanks very much. All right, well, um, again, I'd like to thank our panelists for this wonderful presentation and uh, hope you all enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>